morning, everyone. Hi, this is Anae Augustini. I'm CEO of uh, CID Insurance Programs. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Garage Insured Made Easy uh, uh, webinar today. You uh, are, are in for a, a great webinar. I've got uh, two uh, a garage specialists uh, from Music Insurance, Patty Dutton, uh, Regional Manager, and uh, Dina Glab. Uh, who's the senior garage underwriter, so you can't really get any better uh, other than I, uh, Teresa Cochran, who's uh, our garage underwriter at CID Insurance Programs, is uh, going to be uh, uh, joining us as well, so everyone will be available uh, to answer your questions as we go along. And then not, I want to mention Jacob Cole, who's our marketing specialist. He's our uh, uh, webinar guru who manages the webinars for us. Uh, and so he's in, he'll be in the background taking care of you. Uh, and and uh, uh, if you have any questions or concerns, that whether you can get on or not. So let me uh, get started. Today our objectives, and a little bit of logistics, but our objective really is to understand the differences between the garage form and a CGL coverage form. Uh, we want to be able to identify coverages unique to the garage form, what, what is needed for your service stations, your dealerships, et cetera. Uh, and, um, and then be able to identify the coverage uh, for each of those garage risks, as I just mentioned. So let's talk logistics before I, in, I turn it over for, to our wonderful speakers. Uh, we, we are ever, because there's so many people attending, uh, we, ever, you will be on mute, which you probably have already figured out. You'll be able to hear, but you're not able to speak. So we, uh, thus, we uh, have the chat room off to the right on your, your little um, uh, go to webinar um, uh, bar on the right hand side, typically. Uh, you can chat your questions in, and we'd like you to do that as we go. Uh, in the moment when you have a question, just stick it in there. We'll all be watching uh, and take a moment to answer the questions as we go. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our speakers today. Thank you, Anae. My name is Patty Dutton, and as mentioned, I am the regional manager for the garage department at Music. We really appreciate the time uh, that you are giving to us today for this presentation, and we hope that you find it informative and fun. Uh, I do say fun because Dina and I actually do think that this is fun. Uh, it's it's not as hard as everybody thinks. Uh, a lot of people hear garage, and they're like, Ugh, no, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't want to do that. And it's kind of like, um, for me, if someone says, today we're going to do calculus, I don't hear another word they say because in my head I'm like calculus. I can't do calculus. And then it's just blah, blah words after that. So I'm going to ask you if this is you, it's not calculus, just just sit back and relax and, and let's see if we can't make some of this make sense. To start with, you've got to ask a basic question. What is garage? So in the industry, we define that as anyone in the business of selling, servicing, storing, parking, or repairing an auto. Uh, the, the easy answers that come to mind for an example would be a car dealer or a repair shop and even a valet who parks your car at a restaurant. But what about a motorcycle, a farm tractor, or a forklift? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, go to the next slide and we'll find out. Actually, we're already on the next slide. Go back to that slide. Sorry, I was on the first slide. Okay, so I'm doing real well for the beginning. Um, what I want to do is just spend a couple of minutes, sorry, talking about garage liability coverage because, again, back to the dictionary. You need to understand the definition of the word auto because it's just not the same for the, the CGL as it is for garage. The good news is the garage definition is the easy one. Under the garage coverage form, an auto is a land motor vehicle, trailer, or semi-trailer. And that's it. Pretty broad if you think about it, right? Well, under the CGL, you've got a, a multifaceted, much longer definition. So it starts with a land motor vehicle, trailer, or semi-trailer, and then adds designed for travel on public roads. So that puts a whole different spin on it right out of the gate. 
and then it also talks about any other land vehicle subject to compulsory or financial responsibility laws. So there's another layer. However, auto does not include mobile equipment. So wow, there's three things that don't apply on the garage definition that do on the CGL. So when I asked you if a forklift is an auto a minute ago, well, if you're talking garage, then it absolutely is. But if it's CGL, it is not. Okay, liability. So the CGL has coverage A for bodily injury and property damage liability. And the garage liability has two parts. One is covered auto liability, but the one that matches up with coverage A on the CGL is called other than covered auto liability. And that's where we get our products and premises coverages from. So the CGL has a pretty big exception on how they handle the liability because that form specifically excludes auto exposures, unless you're parking a car that you don't own or rent on or next to your premises. You can buy some limited coverage with the CG2268, but it is limited. It, it's, it's only going to apply to vehicles on the or next to premises that the insured owns, and then that's only for auto repair or service shops, car washes, gas stations, tire dealers, and quick lube. So it's still fairly restrictive. That's the beauty of the garage coverage form because it gives liability both for covered autos and other than covered autos, and that way it's going to meet the needs of somebody who's in the business of selling, servicing, repairing autos. So when the key question is to always ask, is there an auto exposure to this risk? Absolutely. But you might want to take it a step further because, remember, under garage, an auto can be a car, an ATV, or a lawnmower. I just want to give you a couple of examples before we go to the next slide of what other than auto liability exposures look like on the garage policy. So your premises exposures are very similar to the CGL exposure, whereas the biggest exposure that you're going to have is slip and fall by a customer. But the products and completed operations for garage are, are more auto related, as they should be, such as, let's say there's damage and injury that results from faulty workmanship. That's an exposure for a repair shop. For example, if the insured replaces the brakes on somebody's car, but then after leaving the shop, the customer gets into an accident because the brakes failed, that's your garage liability coverage. Because it's not only going to handle the damage to the vehicle and the injuries in the car that the customer hit, it's going to also take care of the damages to our customer's vehicle and anybody who's hurt in that car too. So in this example, both the covered auto and the other than covered auto liability coverages would come to play based on the damages resulting from faulty workmanship. So it's good that they're both there. So Dean is going to take the next slide for us and talk about the garage approach. Hi there. So basically, if you can count to two, then you can write garage. There's two kinds of garage operations. We have the dealers that sell the autos, and then we have the non-dealers that repair, service, store, tow, and park the actual autos. There's also two main garage exposures. We have the liability and the physical damage. And like Patty said earlier, the two liability coverages are the auto, which includes the scheduled auto, and general liability, and then we have the other than auto. And again, there are two physical damage coverages, which consist of the garage keepers, which is the non-owned autos, and then the dealer's physical damage, which are the owned autos. As you will see, there are also more coverage op options available, making the policy work for almost any garage operation. Um, on the next slide, actually, Patty's going to start chit-chatting about limits. Great. So under the garage declarations page, there are three limits for liability. And I know there are more than that on the CGL, but this can be a point of confusion for people, so let's talk about limits. On the deck page, the first limit is for covered autos. The second limit is for other than autos. And then the third limit is actually the ag limit for the other than auto. So just like the GL on your CGL policy, this has an ag limit as well. Now, there are symbols on the garage deck page 
that are used to define what kinds of autos are covered. So for liability, symbol 22 means owned autos are covered. And symbol 29 means non-owned autos used in your garage operation are covered. So what are some examples of covered auto exposures on a garage policy? Well, for dealers, how about test driving a customer's auto before taking it in on a trade? That's very common. And that's why when we issue a garage policy, we use both symbols 22 and 29 for dealers. If we just use 22, which is owned autos, and that dealer takes a customer's car out for a test drive before he takes it in on a trade, and he gets into an accident, well, without symbol 29, there's no liability coverage because he hasn't taken it in on trade yet, so he doesn't own it. Another exposure that dealers have would be transporting autos from auction to the insured's location. Now, what you wanna watch out for on that is for contract drivers, and make sure that if they have an exposure that they disclose it to you. A lot of dealers only use a contract driver when they plan to go to an auction and purchase more cars then they have employees to drive it back. Others use contract drivers all the time, send them all over the place to get cars back. But the driving exposure is important. Another exposure is for the dealer to be furnished an auto for personal use. And you're gonna hear this one come up a little bit from time to time during this presentation. You have to look closely at who lives in his household, how old they are, you know, have you got a 15-year-old that just got their permit and <laughs> they're driving it on a dealer plate? Uh, whether or not any other family members are driving the dealership cars for personal use. Now, this is a huge exposure that frequently generates auto accident claims. Okay, so what about non-dealers? What kind of a covered auto exposure do they have? Well, a mechanic would test drive a customer's auto to make sh sure that the repairs worked. Uh, other repair shops have tow trucks so they might have a scheduled auto exposure. And of course, the valet drives customers' autos from the podium to the parking space and back again. And when that parking lot is off premises, questions arise as to how far they're going and how much traffic there is, et cetera. Because as you know, when you're standing in front of the restaurant waiting for that valet parker to bring your car back, you're in a hurry and you want them to hurry. So if they're hurrying a mile away and back again, that's not such a good thing for us. I think this is a good place to just stop and mention that to get the information you need in order to underwrite a garage risk, you really need to get a garage application. The Accord app just doesn't provide enough information. Now, if you just, you just want to know if something unusual would even be considered before you get a garage app, please just make sure to complete as much of that Accord with the details as you can. Fill in the experience, the loss history, the detail of the operation. These things are frequently blank on the Accord applications that we see, and it makes it kind of hard to answer your question of, would we want to do this or not? All right, Dean is going to take the next slide. So these are the garage liability exclusions. All but one of these is also a commercial general liability exclusion. Racing is specific to garage, so there's no need to exclude that on a GL policy when autos are already being excluded. On the GL form, leased autos are included in the auto exclusion too. So those are the only differences for garage. Um, on the next page, uh, these exclusions don't really remove the need to underwrite the risk. When you get the garage application, you should be looking for information on operations. What kind of operations are they performing? Is it a sales mix uh, consisting of private passenger autos, tractor trailers, farm, contractor's equipment? Are there repairs being performed? Are there any other related operations that we want to look into? What about the loss history? Does it consist of repetitive loss history or was there a shock loss to look at? Uh, experience. While we don't require the dealers to have experience, we do require that the non-dealers have at least three years experience. Uh, the owners and the employees, we want to be sure that you know we're rating for everyone that is listed on the application, whether they're driving or not. Um, this could include the mechanics, the clerical, and even the lot personnel on the lot. Um, who is driving an auto? Is there anyone furnished an auto? Anyone using the auto for just business purposes? 
Uh, and then again, MBRs, we actually look at the prior three years and uh, basically just looking at their violations. Um, perhaps, you know, they've had a few violations. We can actually go ahead and surcharge for those violations. But if they're really terrible at the driving, we might want to just exclude them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and, and to uh, speak to the slide that's currently showing, we've got some endorsement options to talk about. As Dina had mentioned before, we can we can put additional coverage on the garage form in order to make make it meet specific needs that people have. Now, the broadened coverage form is the CA twenty five fourteen, and that gives a lot of bells and whistles. So. You can get personal injury liability all by itself on the CA-2501. You can get that, but there's no advertising injury included. It's all by itself. You can also get damage to rent a premises separately on the CA-2510. But I know for us, and probably some other carriers too, our rates are better for you if you give them broadened coverage, and then you get to be the hero because you're giving them more coverage to boot. So let's see, the things that are covered under broadened coverage, personal and advertising injury covers things like false arrest, libel, and slander. Uh, we talked about damage to rented premises, and that's uh, fire damage to a, a place that they rent that's leased to the insured. It'll cover other causes of loss if they're just renting the property for less than seven days. Another coverage is host liquor liability. And that's going to give you coverage for bodily injury or property damage from giving or serving alcohol at functions that are incidental to the garage business, so long as they're not in the business of making, selling, or serving alcohol. Uh, we tend to see alcohol uh, come up from time to time on motorcycle risks. So you'll have a motorcycle dealership that will have an event, and they might serve beer at the event. That's what this would cover. Of course, if the motorcycle dealership also has a brewery attached to it that they own, then they're now in the business of making, selling, and serving alcohol, and we can't help you. That's not going to do it. Uh, incidental medical malpractice just covers bodily injury from the res resulting from providing or failing to provide medical services. Uh, the bullet points also have, uh, there's one for furnishing food or drink as health care. So what comes to mind on that one would be if, if you think someone's having a diabetic episode and they need a piece of candy and you give it to them and it makes things worse, that's that's what I think that would mean. Or also there's a bullet point for furnishing drugs or medical supplies under that. The non-owned watercraft buys back the total watercraft exclusion by giving coverage to the non-owned watercraft that's under 26 feet. So if it's over 26 feet, you still you still wouldn't have it. Of course, the exclusion does not apply uh, if the v if the boats are on premises where the insured is conducting his garage operation. The additional persons insured is uh, beneficial to a partnership because it gives coverage to the partner's spouses. The automatic coverage means that if the insured acquires or forms a new business that's a garage business, then he gets automatic coverage for the first 90 days. There's a few conditions, like he has to be in charge of the operations at the new place and, and a couple other things, but that's basically what that does. And then lastly, the limited worldwide liability extends their coverage territory to anywhere in the world, as long as uh, it's because the insured's temporarily outside of the regular territory. Or, because of the way the world works these days, if personal and advertising injury offense takes place through the internet or similar electronic communication. But the coverage does not apply to any work performed. Uh, on the other side of the page, UM and UIM, you probably have that on your personal auto policy. This provides coverage if the insured's in a collision with somebody who either doesn't have any insurance or they have insufficient limits. Personal injury protection, not to be confused with personal injury liability, it, it's, a, it's a, also known as PIP, and it applies in several states. These are states that have no-fault laws that require your own auto insurance to be primary for any injuries you have in an auto accident. So for garage, that means we have to offer this for dealers and scheduled autos. And depending on the state, the insured either may or may not be allowed to reject it. Auto dealers E&O gives coverage for the four E&O exposures that are faced by a dealer. You have truth in lending, 
federal odometer, title, and insurance agents exposures. Now, not every dealer is so big that they actually have a title person sitting there or an insurance agent sitting in the dealership. So the cool thing about this coverage is you don't have to buy the whole thing. You can buy one coverage, two coverages, or all four coverages, whatever you want. Now, false pretense is a coverage that's excluded under the garage physical damage coverage section. You can buy it back with the CA2503. This coverage applies if the insured is tricked in departing with a vehicle or if he gets an auto from somebody who doesn't have legal title to it. An example of trickery would be if a supposed customer takes a vehicle on a test drive but never comes back. That's not actually theft because the customer took the vehicle on the pretense of a pre-purchase test drive. It's false pretense. So that's why we require all test drives to be accompanied if the, uh, by the insured if they're going to have false pretense. Otherwise, we don't want to offer it. Medical payments can be purchased either with auto med pay on the CA2505, premises med pay with the CA9903, or you can combine it by adding both forms. Now, this can really help mitigate a bodily injury exposure because it'll pay for somebody's medical bills up front. They don't have to go get a lawyer. If they're not seriously hurt, it, it just takes care of them and everybody's happy. I would like to mention just a couple of others that aren't listed here. One is drive other car. And a lot of people get confused by drive other car. This actually provides non-owned auto coverage to a furnished driver that's listed on the form. So for example, let's say I'm a car dealer and I am furnished an auto for personal use. I don't have any other cars. I just drive my cars off the lot. And by the way, I get a different one every day because I can. But let's say the car I took home last night is sitting in my driveway and today I have a very important doctor's appointment. I have to be there. I run out and I leap into the cherry red Mustang convertible that I just happened to take home last night because I can, and it won't start. <laughs> and I have 10 minutes to get to my appointment. So I run next door and I bang on Dina's door and I say, Dina, Dina, let me take your car. And foolishly, she does. So I peel out of the driveway and immediately hit somebody. Now, if I don't have drive other car coverage, Dina's not only going to be mad at me for hitting the other person and wrecking her car, but she's going to be really mad because I have no coverage. Because remember, for liability, we have symbol 22 for owned autos and symbol 29 for non-owned autos used in your garage operation, which this was not. So it's kind of a nice perk to sell if you know that you've got somebody that's furnished an auto and that they could actually drive somebody else's car once in a while. And then, of course, hired auto, which you probably know from adding it onto a CGL policy, and that's autos leased, hired, borrowed, or rented by the insured, but not owned by their employees. And lastly, I just want to point out that not all endorsements add coverage. Driver exclusions can be used when somebody's MVR is unacceptable, or as Dina said, when they're terrible at driving. Another exclusion is the CA2507, though, and this is the locations and operations not covered. The time to use that is when you want to insure a risk, but there's a piece of it that we can't do or that's covered elsewhere. So supposing that the insured sells campers and RVs. Okay, that's fine. We do those kinds of dealers all the time. But he also has a river rafting business right there in the dealership. Now, he would need GL coverage elsewhere for the river rafting. So what we would do would be to quote the dealership and then use the CA2507 to exclude the river rafting piece of it. That's it for liability. I don't see any questions in the chat box yet. So, Dina, we must be doing a great job. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Next, I, I just want to mention I'd like to encourage anyone who has a question if you, you got on later uh, to go ahead and uh, 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 drop it into the chat box and we'll answer it as we go so please uh, uh, give us your question go ahead Dean. absolutely so next we're going to talk about garage keepers and dealers physical damage coverages Dina 
Perfect. So we've got the two kinds of physical damage. So we have the, the dealer's physical damage, which is also known as dealer's open lot, or DOL, which this applies to the vehicles held for sale and owned by the insured. The garage keepers, which is also known as GK, are the non-owned autos in the insured's care, custody, or control. The garage coverage form has a liability exclusion for property in the insured's care, custody, and control. So if a customer's car is damaged while at the insured's shop, there is no coverage. However, having garage keepers buys it back and covers customers' autos while the insured is repairing, parking, etc. There are the three kinds of coverage op options. We have the legal liability coverage applies based on negligence. You break it, you buy it. So an example, so if I'm pulling an auto into the bay and I hit the door, it was my negligence, therefore I bought it. You also have the direct primary coverage, which applies regardless of negligence, unless excluded elsewhere in the policy. So in this scenario, so if I have a corner retail lot and someone is driving down the street and plows onto my lot and damages a few cars I had on display, well, it wasn't my negligence, but being we have direct primary, we just bought it. And then we have direct excess, which is a third option. All it does is reimburse the customer for their deductible. If the customer has no insurance, it pays nothing. Exactly. Okay. Now, that's not to say in Dina's example, if uh, someone does plow into the cars on our lot, uh, of course, we would go back and, and seek recovery from the other person. Or if that person right. actually did have insurance like they should have, they'd be more than happy to pay. So right, right. that's always something to keep in mind as well. Uh, thank Great. you. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Um, I just thought of that and we hadn't discussed it before, so I thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, let's see. So uh, on the next slide... What we have are the perils that are covered by garage keepers. So, again, to reference your personal auto policy, because at the end of the day, it's all auto, right? It's all kind of the same. So you've got comp, which is pretty much anything except collision or overturn, specified causes of loss, and collision. There are only three specified causes of loss for garage keepers. There's more for the dealer's physical damage. But uh, if you're worried about cost, Specified causes of loss is probably the way to go. Since comprehensive covers everything except the collision or overturn, that coverage does run you a little bit higher, just like it does on your personal auto policy. But what should you be looking for when you underwrite garage keepers? Well, since this is a physical damage coverage, it's all about the car and damage to the car. So the first question you want to know is, do they keep customers' autos overnight? If they do... What is the lot protection? I mean, this guy that's busting in the window on on the screen, did he have to leap a six-foot fence, or did he just walk onto the lot when he went to do that? Are there cameras so that we can figure out who he is? Was there good lighting so that the pictures in the camera show up? Do they even have a history of theft or vandalism? What kinds of vehicles do they repair, and how much are they worth? If they want direct primary coverage, are they located in an area that's prone to storms? Which may not affect you a whole lot in California, but just go to Texas, and all of a sudden, if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you've really got to be careful with hail. So in, in areas like Dallas, the carrier is likely to require a high deductible or maybe an exclusion for wind, hail, and flood. If they valet park, the garage keeper's it's also important to look at where they park and how far it is because not only for liability, but for garage keepers too. If they're going to hit somebody else, they're going to damage the car they're driving. If you want to know if self-parking is allowed in the same lot, because if there is, they have to be able to keep the valet cars separate. Otherwise, it would be a claims nightmare to figure out who caused the damage. The car got parked in the, in the parking lot and it was fine and now it's not. What happened? Some valet operations also manage self-park parking lots, and we cover those. You can write liability only on the same policy as the valet is written on. Another exposure might be storage of RVs, and then the questions we like to know are, what, are who's parking and retrieving them, and whether the propane tanks are empty and disconnected because of the fire hazard. The next slide has the exclusions. 
So contractual obligations, the insured can't can't contractual can, can, bleh, cannot contract to be negligent. You can't do that. So that's why that's excluded. The theft exclusion is for theft caused in any way by you or your employees. Some carriers, and, and we're one of them, say that we exclude theft if you don't have a protected lot, but we offer the ability to buy it back. We just want to charge more. Defective parts and faulty work are very similar to the concept on the CGL. And if, if there's faulty work, we're not going to pay for that, but we'll pay for the resulting damage. And I was trying to think of a good example for that because for faulty work, uh, a lot of times the one that we all want to go to is oil changes, right? Because if I take my car into a shop and I get my oil changed and they forget to put in the plug, my engine's going to blow. The reason that is a terrible example for garage keepers is, remember, garage keepers means that the customer's car is in the insured's care, custody, and control. But guess what? I'm going to have taken my car and made it about two blocks down the road before my car blows up. So it's not garage keepers at that point. It's liability. <laughs> right? But why I can't think of another example off the top of my head, I don't know. So anyway... <laughs> In this instance, if it were, what we would pay for would be the resulting damage, but, but we wouldn't pay for the oil change, the oil, the replacement of the plug, all of that stuff. We just wouldn't do that one. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then um, stereo equipment, because of the, the variation and, and all of that in, uh, in how valuable they can be or, or reproducing sound equipment and all of that, that stuff's all excluded, and war is always excluded. Let's see, on the next slide, we have physical damage, which if you look, has the same comp and specified causes of loss, but there's six causes of loss instead of only three. So Garage Keepers has number one, fire, lightning, explosion, number two for theft, and number five for mischief and vandalism. These other coverages are pulled in for the dealer's physical damage of theft, wind, hail, or earthquake. And then if they are having a vehicle transported by a train or another car or something, then the sinking, burning, or collision of that conveyance, that would be that covered cause of loss. Um, let's see here. As we talked about before, physical damage is first-party coverage for vehicles in the insured's inventory. You're going to choose between comp and specified causes of loss, and we talked about the perils. But just like garage keepers, there are things that you should look for when you're underwriting physical damage. So, again, vehicle storage. What's the lot protection? Do you detect a theme here? <laughs> Is it fenced and gated? Are there cameras? Is it well lit? But physical damage has the added component of the furnished auto. See, I told you we were going to come back to that again. Is anybody furnished an auto? <laughs> and who is it? And where do they keep the car? And what is the exposure? And then, of course, you're always looking at what kinds of vehicles that, that they sell and how high the value is. I mean, we we tend to see a lot of mom and pop car dealerships with maybe an average value of five to ten thousand dollars per car. We also, however, insure people who sell used Maseratis and Jaguars, and the per vehicle limit is much higher on those. So, how much more concerned am I going to be about a fenced and gated lot for? The first guy who's selling between five and ten thousand per car in value, and the guy with the Jags. So it, it all makes sense if you think about it. Uh, and then lastly, of course, is the weather. And I know again, you guys don't see a lot of it, but if you know that you're in an area that is subject to storm, you really have to make sure to use those deductibles or watch for the exclusions that the carrier might have. All right, and then on the next slide, just to finish that part out, is uh, collision. 
which is, of course, collision with another object. Now, I don't know about you, but when I went to school, they told me I couldn't define a word by using the word, but we do that here. <laughs> collision okay. is collision with another object or overturn. I guess it makes it easier to handle. If you hit a bird or an animal, though, just so you know, the garage form will let you choose whether you want to cover that as a collision claim or a comp claim. That's mostly because some people have a lower deductible for comp than for collision, or because a comp claim might be viewed as less incriminating than a collision claim, so to speak. So if you're seeing somebody that's got a lot of claim frequency, and it's involving a lot of collisions, if they hit that bird or that deer or whatever, they might prefer to have that paid as comp because then their loss history isn't going to be looked at uh, as less favorably, perhaps. All righty. Um, I am going to take the PD exclusions next. So as you guys know, war and nuclear hazard are not insurable risks. And any coverage that's provided under TRIA does not apply to auto policies at all. It's property, it's CGL, but it is not garage, it's not auto. So that's why those first two exclusions are there. You can't do anything about that. Uh, the number three is a rental exclusion. So unless you can't, um, unless you can't, uh, Take in the vehicle, unless you're taking in the customer's vehicle. Sorry, lost my train of thought. Unless you take in a customer's vehicle and repair it, then anything that you do as far as rental is going to be excluded under the policy. But, you know, if I bought my car from Dina and I take my car back to Dina so she can fix it and I need a car, she can loan me one and it'll be covered under this situation. The racing exclusion applies whether the vehicle is being used in practicing for or preparing for a race. The expected profit is kind of a sore subject sometimes with the dealers because what they think they have is coverage for what they would have made if they'd been able to sell the car. But let's face it, the sticker price isn't necessarily what they would get for a car. And it's a slippery slope to try to ensure somebody's profit. That's not a good thing to do. The next bullet point is loss to a covered auto at a location that's not in the in the schedule. What we do offer is coverage for up to 45 days from the date that you began to use that location. Keep in mind, the garage policy in general follows the insured everywhere they go, okay? It has to because cars are mobile, so the policy has to be mobile. But in order to properly insure inventory, you can't just let cars go anywhere or be anywhere. And so this is the way that that is controlled. And we did already talk about the false pretense. All right, so I think we can do the next slide. And that is uh, physical damage coverage limit of insurance. So as we just said, the insured cannot profit from the loss. They have to provide a bill of sale and receipts for any money they put into the car. And then, at the end of the day, the most we will pay for a total loss is either the lesser of the ACV or the cost to repair it or replace it with like kind and quality. I will tell you that one of the most important things on this screen right now is that coinsurance clause at the bottom. There is a penalty applied if the insured's inventory values are higher at the time of the loss than the lot limit on the policy. So, Dina, how should you determine what limits are needed on the policy in order to not incur a coinsurance penalty? Well, the garage well, should show the average and the maximum number of vehicles on the lot. Exactly. Maximum value. Exactly. But so what do we do? Do we take the maximum of everything and that's what they have to have? Do we take the least amount that they have? These are the average. We use the average. And that's the value they tend to have on their lot the majority of the time. Now, sometimes that can be really easy to figure out, and sometimes it's not. Uh, we had uh, an insured who 
was severely underinsured. He had a loss in the fall. No, he did not. He had a loss in April. That's what it was. He had a loss in April, and he was underinsured by 50%. Turned out that when he bought his policy in the fall, that limit was exactly what he needed. But every year between March and July, June, really, his inventory shot way up. You want to know why? Tax returns. So he doubled his inventory during tax season in order to take advantage of all the people who had cash in their pockets to buy a car. But the rest of the year, his limit would have been completely fine for what he had. So guess what we did? Did we make him insure to that total value that he has in April? No, we came up with a better way. We issued the policy with the lower limits, and then we did an endorsement that said, I think we said like from the middle of March through the middle of June, his limit would be the higher amount. And then that way, he only had to pay for the exposure that he actually had, but he didn't get caught with too much inventory on his on his lot. So that was how we handled that one. I think one of the, the cool things that, that we try to do is when something makes sense, look for a way to make it work. And that's what we did with this guy. Mm -hmm. yep. All righty. Let's see here. Rating factors. Money. Everybody's favorite topic. Uh, for dealers, the garage liability is based on rating units. And the rating units describe the person's duties and their use of an auto. So there's one rating unit for if you're furnished. There's another one for if you only drive for business use. There's another one if you're a secretary or a mechanic. On service risks, we rate based on payroll. And the only caveat for payroll is either full-time or part-time. Again, everyone is always included in the rating, not just the drivers. That is the rating basis, is all the people. A furnished driver uses dealer vehicles for personal use, such as driving to and from work, going on vacation, or going out to eat. Furnished drivers have the highest rating unit to account for also having the highest exposure and the highest number of probably accidents. So it's just a good thing to keep in mind. Dealer plates. Let's talk about what is a dealer plate first. It does not make sense for a dealer to have to register and get license plates for every car they sell. They would have to just have somebody permanently sitting down at the town hall, the DMV, in order to accomplish that. So instead, they use dealer plates to transport vehicles from auction, allow customers to test drive, and of course, for their own personal use when they're furnished an auto. We would expect a risk to have up to two plates per employee. So we do ask for an explanation if there are more than that. Some states now use paper plates, paper dealer plates for test drives. They might get one hard plate from the state and then they can print off paper plates as they're needed and then those plates just have a real short lifespan. For rating, the only thing rated based on dealer plates is PIP and UM. The dealer plates though are also important for underwriting the account. If you only have two employees and they have 22 plates, something's missing. <laughs> You're either missing information or something. Now, for states that do use the paper plates, we just rate PIP and UM based on the number of employees instead of the number of plates. So that's how we can accommodate that. And I do believe that that is all that there is. Thank you, Dina and Patty, so much. Uh, you did a great job. Your knowledge is uh, well uh, uh, is very valuable for everyone I, that attended today, uh, including myself, as always. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, Jacob is going to be following up with an email to all of you uh, with a link to uh, this uh, webinar. It will all also be published on our website as well. You can have your employees or yourself go in and watch it over and over again, just as if you were here now. Uh, and uh, I think we've got uh, some marketing material that you can customize that's going to go out with that as well uh, for Garage. Uh, and, um, and, and, and we'd love to have you start submitting uh, uh, applications 
uh, and if you have any questions to contact Teresa Cochran, uh, you've got her email address and, and her uh, phone number there. And we look forward to doing uh, some garage business with you. Yes, thank you. If you have any thank questions, you so much for having please. Us. Oh, yes. Uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, uh, even if uh, we're closing out, get them into the chat and we, we could even reach out to you later. Okay. Doesn't look like no. we have any questions at this time, but uh, if you do, please don't hesitate uh, to email them to us. All right. Thank, Thank you for joining you so us. Much. Have a great day, Happy everyone. Me. Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Annie.